All right. Good day. Hope things are going smoothly. Um, main thing today is like, primary above all other things. Objective today is test questions. If you have any thing that you want to ask about regarding the uh, test that is currently live, please let me know. That's the main thing that I want to talk about above all else. If those, if you don't have any questions, then I will continue talking about waves and light. But that's the main thing that I want to focus first and foremost on. Uh, so let me know while I get a few things set up. Chime in if there's literally anything test two or exam related that is on your mind, be it content or structure or mechanics, anything at all. Hold on, for some reason I can't hear you. Okay, that's better. I'm sorry, don't know what that was. Yes, uh, test two is 15, 16, 17, which is in order electric forces and fields, capacitors, uh, resistor circuits, including current and voltage, and then uh, I, I suppose technically we covered some stuff that was... Some, some material over this class might call some of the circuit stuff 18, but I lumped it in with 17, so... 15, 16, 17, and then the bits of 19 and 20 we covered for magnets. Basically everything since the first test. The first test was heat and thermo. Everything we've done since then, except the light stuff that I talked about yesterday. And you're welcome. Um, and as a reminder, if you want... Uh, that information do, it does exist written, so you don't have to just memorize it. If I can, if WebAssign will work correctly today. Alright, logged into WebAssign. Uh, in the Test 2 tab, under the the very first thing in the Test 2 tab, uh, Test 2 concept sheet, that lists not only all the formulas that you should be familiar with, but all of the concepts that relate to those formulas. Uh, so from 15 through to the mag magnet stuff we talked about in 19. Uh, I've crossed a few things out that the summer course didn't quite get into. Um, but everything here that isn't crossed out is stuff that we talked about and is labeled here with... The, the formulas here are ones that you should be aware of. You can even use this as your formula sheet if you want to. And they're all labeled with the relevant concepts as well. So looking over this to make sure that it all looks familiar, that you understand what each formula does is a good way of studying. It's a good checklist. Okay. Anything, if, I, I figure I sound like a dead record, but maybe it's just my anxiety playing up. I want to make sure everyone has what they need. Uh, again, any other test stuff, cut me off. Whatever I'm talking about, I want you to let me know what you need as you need it. If there's nothing else presently on your mind, then quick reminder, we will have in-person lab tomorrow. Um, oh, that's what I was supposed to do. I'll also be posting the two out-of-class labs that'll be the last two. They'll be very short, independent, investigative type things. I'll post those today just so that you have access to them as soon as possible. 
and test is due by Saturday, and we'll spend next week reviewing and exam prepping and stuff. Um, today and Friday, when during times where there isn't exam questions or test two questions, we'll talk a little more about light. So we'll transition into that now if there's nothing else immediately pressing to discuss. But if you have some other question while I'm talking, I want you to cut me off. All right. Everything looks good. Okay. So yesterday we talked about the electromagnetic nature of light. Um, as with all waves, light is traveling energy. It just travels in the form of an electric field and a magnetic field, which does make it electromagnetic phenomena like what we've been talking about for the past month. Just rather than existing as one type of field or the other by itself, it's both at the same time. Light is a very weird thing, and there's still a lot about it that physics still doesn't quite understand. Uh, you, Depending on what science classes or what science media you might have observed in the past, um, there's still some debate as to whether or not light should be treated as a wave or a particle, because in some cases it kind of acts a little bit like both. It kind of acts like a particle without any mass. Uh, and some people call that particular particle, that instance of light, uh, a photon. But even if it does act like a particle, it does still act like a wave, and we can still use our wave behaviors and our knowledge of waves to help describe it. Uh, as such, Brief reminder, there's some wave vocab currently on screen. We touched on these a little bit yesterday. Main ones we're going to focus on for today are the aspects of wave frequency and wavelength. Wavelength is physically the length of a wave. It's namely the length of one entire wave form. If you were to make a drawing of what most people think of as a wave, the wavelength, represented here by a lowercase Greek lambda. I'll draw it a little bit bigger down here. Greek lambda kind of looks like a rotated Y. Wavelength is physical length. You take a tape measure and you just measure one physical whole waveform, and one waveform is the distance it needs to repeat itself, basically. Here I drew one wavelength as being the distance from one crest to the next crest, but you could also draw it trough to trough. You could draw it rising midpoint to rising midpoint. They're all the same wavelength. It's just the distance between two, between the two instances of the same point on the wave, just physical length. All waves have them, even if they're not physical. So light does have a wavelength, you just can't really measure it with your eye or a tape measure. Uh, what we are able to measure about light is its frequency. Uh, frequency is kind of the inverse of time, whereas time measures how long it takes for a single instance of something to happen, frequency measures how often something happens in one second. So if something has a frequency of 2 hertz, it happens twice every second. Uh, that's for that reason, 1 hertz is defined as one instance of something per second. Uh, 10,000 hertz would be 10,000 somethings happening in one second. So for waves, if a wave had a frequency of 10,000 hertz, um, one whole wave would pass 10,000 times every second. So, and that logic applies to more than just waves. The definition of frequency is 
well, it's on screen, the rate of how often an event occurs, that isn't specifically a wave thing, but we use it to describe waves because it tells us how many waves pass in a certain amount of time. And for the sake of human sensory experience, the two senses that humans have access to that rely on waves, sight and hearing, frequency is the primary thing that determines what color of light you're seeing or what type of sound you are hearing. So those are the two vocab words on this list that we are going to be focusing on for the time being for our short little foray into this subject. So, uh, wave frequency, the variable for that is F, it is measured in hertz. Wave length, the variable for that is lambda. It is a physical length, which means we can still measure it in meters. Uh, as a result of that, since wavelength, sorry, since frequency is one divided by seconds, and since wavelength is physical meters, if you were to multiply a wave's frequency times its wavelength, that would be one over seconds times meters, meters per second. So if you multiply a wave's frequency by its wavelength, you can determine that wave's velocity. And some things to know about wave speed is that specific types of waves have constant velocity. I mentioned yesterday that light, the speed of light, is a constant capped value everywhere in the universe. Speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second squared. It doesn't matter what type of light you're looking at, it doesn't matter what color it is, and it doesn't matter if it's one of these other types of electromagnetic radiation, they all move at that same speed. And so for a single type of wave, since all colors of light move at the same speed, and since every color of light has a different frequency, if wave speed is constant, changing the frequency would also change the wavelength. Namely, if wave speed is constant, driving frequency up causes wavelength to drop. Uh, you, wavelength and frequency multiplied together it would need to be two different numbers to multiply to become the same velocity each time. So, for a single type of wave, for light, every single frequency also has a matching corresponding wavelength. So, uh, for example, on screen right now is the bands of visible light that corresponds to each of the main colors that we tend to identify. Um, Red light can have a frequency of 480 to 405 terahertz. That's a very big frequency. Uh, and those specific frequencies correlate to specific wavelengths. We have here the correlating frequency, the cor correlating wavelength to uh, 480 terahertz is 625 nanometers, and the corresponding wavelength for 405 terahertz is 740 nanometers. So since wave velocity is always the same for a single type of wave, each wavelength and frequency have a specific set such that they multiply together to create that same speed. For a single constant wave type at a constant speed, changing the wavelength will also change the frequency. So you can actually identify color not just by its frequency, but also by its wavelength, since one wavelength always has to be tied specifically to a certain frequency. For sound, it's similar, because sound also has a constant velocity, and I'll make sure that's information available to you. Velocity of sound in air, which is how most people hear sound, is 343 meters per second. So in air, a single sound of a certain frequency also has a corresponding wavelength like the colors here do. 
the main difference for sound is the speed of sound can change depending on the temperature and pressure of the air, or alternatively, if you're hearing it, it through something that isn't air, because technically human ears work underwater, and underwater the speed of sound increases because water is more dense than air. Um, and so underwater, the frequencies would have different wavelengths, and that's one reason why human hearing doesn't work so well underwater. Your ear was calibrated to work in air for the frequency uh, wavelength matching pairs in air. Underwater, speed is different, the wavelength of the frequency would be different, and as a result, things don't quite sound right underwater. Even if you're very used to operating underwater, things don't. Like, you, you wouldn't be able to understand human speech nearly as well underwater. <clears throat> when I was a kid, hanging out at the pool with my brother and cousins over the summer, we would definitely try to talk to each other underwater, like kind of play underwater telephone, see if you could determine what someone was saying. Never worked. Never worked. The human ear isn't built for it. At least not to my experience. So, single types of waves traveling through a specific medium have a capped velocity, and that capped velocity determines the frequency wavelength pair for that type of wave specifically. Uh, and since the speed of light never changes, speed of sound can, but speed of light can't, uh, its frequencies and wavelengths are permanently synchronized. One wavelength will always have the same matching frequency. Uh, we can use that information in a few sample questions here. Um, this, the formula, wave speed equals wavelength times frequency, works for all types of waves, be it light or sound. So for example, if we have a 10 meter wavelength sound, we can figure out the frequency of that particular sound. Uh, so wave speed equals wavelength times frequency. Speed of sound in air is 343 meters per second. That's gonna equal our wavelength of 10 times a frequency that we're going to calculate. And that frequency would be 3.43 Hertz. Wait. Oh, I did that wrong. I made a mistake when I was making these notes. My mistake. I apologize. I can fix that real quick. Because 343 3 divided by 10 would be 34.3 hertz. Excuse me. Now, just to kind of give you some baseline information that might be helpful to you, uh, the absolute maximum range of human hearing I'm going to see if I can write this in here in small font I know if I draw it in it'll be impossible to read The range of human hearing, the best possible case for the band of frequencies of sound that a human can hear, is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. So a human could hear this sound. A human could hear a wave of a wavelength of 10 meters long, but just barely. This would be re this would register as a very odd bass tone that you might not even realize you're hearing at first. You'd have to probably concentrate on it to be able to tell that this sound existed. Uh, 20 is the lowest, uh, and 20,000 is the highest. So humans can hear some pretty high-pitched noises, but that maximum number is constantly dropping every single second that you're alive. 20,000 hertz is the best a human can hear when their eardrum is perfect, pristine, literally just born. Every second you're alive after that, the cells of your eardrum age and divide and aren't quite as effective anymore. So as you grow up at probably your age, your hearing cap is probably somewhere between 16 and 18,000. I know mine is closer to 16,000 just because I'm older and because I've listened to a lot of loud music. Uh, so take care of your ears because that top number drops pretty radically as you age. 
uh, there's a lot of senior citizens that can't hear higher than 10,000 hertz. And that's one reason why, I think that's one reason why the elderly and young people can never agree on music. Literally, there are sounds young people can hear that old people can't. But a human could hear a 34 hertz sound, but just barely. It's not a sound range that you're used to hearing. Uh, formula works on light as well. What frequency and therefore color is a 550 nanometer wavelength photon. So we can use the same formula, but we'll need to plug in the speed of light instead, which is again 3 times 10 to the 8th, fastest thing in the universe. We'll plug in the new wavelength, 550 nanometers. Uh, na the prefix for nano is times 10 to the negative ninth. I think it goes milli is times 10 to the negative third. Micro is times 10 to the negative sixth. Nano is times 10 to the negative ninth. I think the next one down is femto at times 10 to the negative twelfth. Um, but most light that you'll see has a wavelength in, actually all light that the human eye can see has a wavelength in the nanometer range. It's very, the wavelength of light is physically very small. Uh, if we ca calculate that corresponding frequency, we're going to divide a big number by a very small number, so we're going to get an even bigger answer. That's 5.45 times 10 to the 14th hertz. Again, looking at the previous slide, these frequencies are in the terahertz range. So that tracks with what we've been told previously. Uh, our, if we look back at our wavelength here, 550 nanometers, if we look back at this uh, list of colors here, 550 nanometers falls within the green range right here, between 520 and 565 nanometers. So the photon we were just examining happens to be a green one. Uh, the way that the human eye works, uh, every different photon based on its frequency has a different color. When those photons enter your eyeball, and this is starting to range on biology, which is not quite my specialty, so uh, bio teachers will probably be able to tell you more. Uh, when the light enters your eye, there's photoreceptive cells on the back of it that are able to, uh, some of them, are able to react to the color of light that enters and strikes them. So literally, lasers enter your eye, the cells on your back absorb the laser, and they react in certain combinations based on what color you saw. I believe the human... I forget if rods or cones are the ones that detect color, but whichever one it is, um, they come in a triple pair, red, blue, and green, and they react in different combinations to different frequencies of light. So if a green photon enters your eyeball, uh, the green rod or cone will react to it and it'll send a signal to your brain that registers that you saw green. Um, red and blue have their own specific rods and cones that they trigger. Uh, combinations of colors, colors that aren't red, blue, and green, trigger different combinations of those rods and cones. For example, yellow light triggers the red cone and the green cone. Again, I forget if it's rods and cones. I forget which one's which. Uh, red and red, uh, yellow light triggers the red and green sensor at the same time, and trigger the fact that both get triggered at once tells your brain that you saw yellow. It's just a slightly more efficient system than having to have a different sensor for every single different color. Uh, purple light or violet light triggers the red and blue at the same time, uh, so on and so forth. And therefore, people who are colorblind, sometimes they, their rods and cones don't work quite the same way as other people's do when it comes to triggering different combinations of colors entering their eyes. Sometimes they might not respond to certain colors of photon the same way, or there might be an issue with the optic nerves getting some signals mixed up on their way to the brain. There's different types of color blindness, and so the exact mechanics vary from person to person. So, whether it's sound or hearing, 
sorry, whether it's sound or color, this formula will work for both. Uh, but the thing about wave speed to keep in mind is it is still speed. It is still a velocity. And that means you can still use V equals distance over time to uh, analyze it to uh, determine some things about it. Um, so as kind of a classic example, and you may have heard of something like this before, I'm hoping you've heard of something like this before, uh, you hear a thunderclap five seconds after the lightning bolt. How far away did the lightning strike? You might have seen some trick where someone can listen for thunder and try to determine how far away a storm is. Uh, we're going to put some math to that now. When you see lightning, keep in mind light travels s several thousand times faster than sound does. So when you see lightning, the light given off by a lightning strike, it that light almost in, functionally instantly reaches your eye. It's not quite instant, but it's so fast that it's basically instant. But the sound takes a lot longer to catch up, especially if you're further away. So in order to figure out how far away a lightning strike was, you watch for the lightning, and then you count how many seconds between seeing the bolt and hearing the corresponding thunder. In this case, you heard the thunder five seconds after you saw the lightning bolt. Uh, since the hearing is sound, we're going to use the speed of sound for this one. So velocity of the sound is 343. We want to know the distance that that thunder traveled, the sound wave traveled, in five seconds. So we'll solve for D, and that gives us a distance of 1,715 meters, or 1.7 kilometers. And we could convert that to miles. That'd be at least two miles, I think. Wait, no. I'm getting that backwards. It's, it's 1.7 kilometers. I'm going to leave it at that. And so you can use this trick to try to figure out how far away a storm is. Or at minimum, at least have the baseline knowledge that the longer the time between seeing the lightning and hearing the thunder, the further away the lightning strike was, the further away the storm is. If you see lightning and hear the thunder immediately, then that... Not only is that storm close, but that particular lightning strike was very close. So be cautious in such a situation. Uh, one more sample question involving wave speed. Uh, we'll do one for light this time. Uh, and this is an actual thing. This is These numbers are taken from actual NASA procedures. There is a 30-minute lag when sending commands to the Mars rover. People at NASA who are controlling the rover, they are watching the rover's feed, they are monitoring everything that it's doing, and they press forward on their joystick to tell the rover to go forwards. Um, NASA, NASA's satellites then send a signal to the rover and specifically the signal that they send is a radio wave. And radio waves are the same waves that literally radios use, but also the same, well, they're on the electromagnetic spectrum, which makes them basically the same thing as light. Uh, radio waves are just light waves of a different wavelength and frequency. Since they are still electromagnetic radiation, they travel at the same speed. This is why your phone's Wi-Fi, your phone's 5G, hopefully works very fast because literally it's able to send a signal to the tower and get information back at light speed. So the radio waves that we send to the Mars rover literally travel at light speed. But Mars is very, very far away. It's so far away that it takes 30 minutes for that radio wave to get to Mars for the rover to then begin moving forward and for it to send its own signal, its own camera signal, back to Earth and then for Earth, the scientists at NASA, to be able to actually see on their cameras that the rover began moving. 
So 30 minutes for a radio wave to get from Earth to Mars to be processed and then for Mars to send an equivalent signal back. It's a very long distance away and since we know light speed, we can figure out what that distance is. Now, what's happening here is basically an echo. Uh, to equate this to sound, if you shout into a cave and it takes, you eventually hear an echo about five seconds later, what happens is it took two and a half seconds for your sound waves to hit the back of the cave and then two and a half more seconds to come back to you. So any sort of an echo, the time it takes to actually strike the object in question is half of the time it takes for you to get your echo back. So since it takes 30 minutes to send a signal to Mars and get it back, that means it only took 15 minutes for the signal to get to Mars in the first place. And uh, 15 minutes is the equivalent of 900 seconds. So we can use 900 seconds in our velocity formula with the speed of light to figure out the distance between Earth and Mars. So speed of light is, again, 3 times 10 to the 8th equals distance between Mars and Earth divided by the time it takes to send the signal, 900 seconds. And so Mars and Earth are 2.7 times 10 to the 11th meters apart, very far. There is a similar lag between the Sun and the Earth. Uh, sun and Earth are very far apart, and so it takes an actual measurable amount of time for light from the Sun to reach the Earth, although that lag is only eight minutes. Um, what that should tell you is that Earth is actually closer to the Sun than Earth is to Mars. Earth is closer to the Sun than it is to Mars because uh, electromagnetic radiation is able to get from the Sun to Earth faster than it is able to get from the Earth to Mars. So uh, a lot of model, a lot of like the models you play with of solar systems as a kid kind of show everything as being pretty equidistant, but Mars is a lot further away than a lot of those models ever show. So something to keep, keep in mind about our solar system. Questions, comments, concerns, etc., please let me know. We're getting through these light topics pretty quickly. We might cover everything I wanted to talk about today. Yeah, I think we will. Okay. So I mentioned that light is still a pretty mysterious thing. Uh, humans, like I said, you can't really detect light, you can't detect single photons on their own. So for most of human history, before we knew what a photon was, or even still into today, the way that we measure what light and other waves in general really are is not by observing them directly, but observing the things that they do. It's kind of, well, it's the same with energy. You can't really see energy by itself. You just see what objects that have energy are able to do with it. And so, um, it's the same thing with waves. We are, we can't really detect them directly because even, uh, your two senses that use waves, you don't really detect individual waves. You just detect the colors you see or the pitch of sound that you hear. It can't really identify super accurately where it came from or what the specific wave was like other than its color and its pitch. So over the years, we've just had to form some educated guesses about wave structure based on the things that we can observe waves doing. And over the years, scientists have identified three key behaviors about what waves do when they hit things. Because uh, when a wave strikes something, that's the easiest time that you can see that it's doing something. Again, light traveling in a direction, you don't really know that it's there or what it's doing until it hits something. You don't know that light exists until it physically enters your eyeball. And in that motion, it is hitting 
the photoreceptive cells inside of your eyeball. Same with sound. You don't really know that it's there until it physically strikes your body. So what we know most about waves is what they do when they hit stuff. And so we call these the wave boundary interactions because it's just a fancy way of saying that the wave struck a boundary. It physically hit something other than what it was already traveling through. And when it does that, it's going to change its behavior in some way, shape or form. And there's three key things that waves do when they hit boundaries. And I guarantee you have observed all of them in your life before. I just want to put in your mind that they are wave boundary interactions. Uh, the three wave interactions we're going to talk about are reflection, refraction, and absorption. And of the two, reflection and absorption are the ones that you... Well, you've seen all of these. You, you know what all of these are. So these are not going to be new concepts to you. Uh, reflection is literally exactly what it sounds like. Sometimes when wave hit things, they literally just bounce back off. Uh, this is the case with mirrors. Uh, light will strike a reflective surface and it's just going to bounce back off again. Literally with a mirror, that's what is happening. Light from your, if you're looking into a mirror, light that bounces off of your body bounces off of the mirror and then it can enter your eyeball. Whereas normally the light bouncing off of your body wouldn't enter your eye again. Um, main thing to know about reflection is that waves bounce away from things at the same angle they approach it at. Uh, which is why it's easiest to see yourself in a mirror when you are standing directly in front of it and the light traveling off of you is able to strike it square on perpendicularly at a 90 degree angle. So if it enters the mirror at a 90 degree angle, it will come back out at a 90 degree angle. And so it actually will, it'll travel then back in the same direction it came from. Uh, firing things at other angles, uh, it'll reflect away at the same angle. And you've probably held mirrors in ways to make use of this before. Car mirrors work like this because they don't really exist for you. You're, yeah, you're, the mirrors in cars don't exist for you to see a reflection in them. You angle them such that light is able to strike them from behind you and bounce off at the same angle to enter your eye. And that's why they all need to be set at different angles so that you can see light coming in from different directions. Um, this principle is referred to as Snell's Law. You don't have to memorize that, but that's what it's called. Uh, the thing about reflection that you might not have known about is that everything actually reflects light, not just shiny objects, not just mirrors. Everything that you can see reflects light in some way, shape, or form. It's just a question of whether or not that reflection is specular or diffuse. Whenever light strikes anything, it has a chance of reflecting off. Uh, for example, um, trying to think of a object I can use here. This, if you look at this, you would see the color red. And this particular object doesn't actually generate its own red light. What happens is light from the lamp overhead, which is generated in all colors, the sun generates light in all colors, lamps generate light in all colors, and that light is going to strike this particular object and since the object is red, the red light is going to bounce off of it. That red light reflects off of this, game, this object and then back into my eyeball. Um, but if you look at this particular object, you're not going to see a reflection in it. It's coarse fabric. It's not actually going to show a reflection in its surface. Light is bouncing off of it, but because it has a very rough surface, this is kind of tied into the way that friction works as well. Most surfaces are rough and jagged if you zoom in far enough. And that means that this object's surface, different photons that strike it in different places are going to bounce off at different angles. Because even if all the photons are coming in the same direction, all of the surfaces they hit are at different angles and therefore those incident photons are going to bounce away at different angles. And so something like this 
isn't able to form a clear reflection because it's sending photons in all different directions. Whereas a flat, polished mirror is so smooth that all the photons coming in are able to bounce away at the same angle. And so if those incoming photons were forming a picture, then the photons bouncing away, since they're all traveling together in the same direction still, they're able to form the same clear picture. So the difference between a mirror and literally every other object you can see is how smooth and polished they are on the atomic level. The smoother and more polished something is, the more reflective it is, the easier it is to see an image reflected in its surface. And you've probably observed that before. Uh, sometimes you have to polish a mirror to a rate, to a shine, to a smoothness before you can see something in it. Uh, metal doesn't always reflect light unless you take the time to buff and polish it and smooth it out. So that's why mirrors work as, and why they are different to most other objects. Everything reflects but only mirrors reflect all light at the same angle to form a proper image. The next wave boundary interaction that I want to point out to you that you've seen before is refraction. And this is the idea that when light when light hits something, it doesn't always bounce off of it. Depending on what it strikes, sometimes that light could enter and travel through the new object instead. For example, if you look out of a window, the light you see coming in through the window was originally traveling through air, then it starts traveling through the glass of the window, then it starts traveling through air again as it exits the glass before it strikes your eye. So looking through a window, the light you see had to travel through a glass barrier before it can reach you. And something interesting that scientists have noticed is that when light travels through a different object, when it changes the object that it's traveling through, so when it goes through the boundary from air to glass, or even air to water, as another example, Sometimes it bends and changes direction. The act of entering another material bends the light sometimes and changes the direction that it's moving in. There are two key places where you've definitely seen this happen before. The first, well, I guess three, actually. I'm going to rewind and say that there's three places you've seen this. The first is in the case of lenses. Why are those different pictures? The entire purpose of a lens, be it on glasses or a microscope or something, or, or a camera, is to bend light, to send light to a... Uh, the purpose of a lens on your glasses, or even the purpose of the lens on your own eyeball, um, is to take all the incoming light and bend it such that it all travels to a specific point. The, the lens that normally exists on your eye, on the front of it that the light enters through, uh, it exists so that all the light coming in, once it travels through that lens, once it goes from air into the material of your eye, bends the light inwards so that all of it strikes the cells on the back that allow you to see. Uh, if your lens wasn't there and didn't bend all the light, then you'd only be able to see in a narrow cone in front of you. But because of this, because of the lens, uh, your eye is able to bend in light coming from all different directions, from all over the front side of your head, and bend it such that it does still hit the back of your eye. Whereas, if that lens wasn't there, you'd only be able to see through the narrow opening on the front of your eye in a straight line, which would be kind of awful. Um, if you need glasses, it means that the lens on your eye doesn't quite bend light the way that it's supposed to, and you need an extra lens on the front to bend it in just the right way to get that all the light to where it needs to go. Uh, another place where you've seen this happen before...
Ah, the picture I want isn't in these notes. Um, but another place that you've seen this before is in an optical illusion like this. You may have noticed that if you've got an object that's partially sticking in and out of water, sometimes it kind of looks like there's a break in the image at the water's surface, and the part that's under the water looks like it's in a different position than the part that's above the water. Uh, you might have noticed this when you put like a straw into your drinking glass. It kind of looks like the bottom of the straw has shifted some distance away from where it's supposed to be. The image currently on screen is a big logical uh, extreme of this example. This picture was designed, this situation was designed to maximize this refraction to really bend that light out of shape and send it in a direction it's not supposed to go. This guy is not decapitated, but the light coming from under the water is bent to such a degree that it looks like his lower body is in a place where it's not supposed to be. So refraction is what's responsible for this phenomenon, for this thing you've probably seen when water and glass are involved before. But the last place that this comes up, that you've, again, definitely seen before, is in the case of prisms. The entire purpose of a prism is to bend light in such a way that all of its colors bend away in different directions. Light coming from the sun, light made from a light bulb, white light is every color of light traveling together at the same time. So when your eyes register seeing white, What's happening is every color is entering your eye and striking all of those photoreceptive cells at once. And when R, G, and B are all triggered at once, you see white, whereas red just triggers R or yellow triggers R and G. Now what a prism does, and this includes things that act like prisms, like water in a lot of cases. Water is the prism that creates rainbows, for example. What prisms are able to do is, when white light enters the prism, that light is going to bend, because all light bends when it enters a new material, and prisms are made out of glass or crystal that light can travel through. What happens is that different colors of light are able to bend to different degrees. The different colors all inherently bend in slightly different directions. Red light is going to bend to a different degree to violet light. And what a prism is able to do is it bends the light so much that all the colors end, out come, end up shooting out of it in different directions. Whereas if you were just looking directly at the source of white light, then all those colors would be traveling in the same direction. And that's why they trigger all of the cells at the same time. But a prism can separate them such that they trigger the different cells at the same time and so that you can see different colors. So... Prisms, the act of separating the color down, the white light down into its resonant uh, constituent frequencies, is a result of refraction. Uh, the last and probably most boring uh, wave boundary interaction is absorption. And this is just the idea that when light hits something, it, its energy could just be absorbed by it and then not travel anywhere. Reflection is the energy bouncing off. Refraction is the energy traveling through. Absorption is the energy just joining the object and then the light stops existing, basically. Uh, I mentioned earlier that when you see a object that is red white light hits it and the red light bounces off and that red light is what then enters your eye and lets you see red. Well, white light is every single color at once and this object only reflects the red light. So every color orange through violet is instead absorbed by this object and that just has the uh, that's now that energy is just inside of it as thermal energy making it warmer. And this is why Earth is warmed by the sun. Literally, when light strikes you and you absorb it, you're absorbing the energy that that light was made of in the form of thermal energy, and that just warms you up. So that's why being in direct sunlight is always going to be slightly warmer than being in the shade. 
Literally, light strikes you, you absorb some of its energy, uh, and you'll reflect some of it. Like, my shirt, I call my shirt maroon, maybe dark red. My shirt will reflect some red light, but all the rest of it will be absorbed, and that just makes me warmer, ultimately. Um, where was I going with that? Oh, uh, absorption is what makes you warm in direct light. Absorption is also the principle that lets solar panels work. Solar panels are designed in such a way that when they absorb energy from light, they're able to turn it into electricity as opposed to just heat. So those are the properties of, those are the three wave boundary interactions that I wanted to talk about. Um, absorption can get kind of weird when, well, I'm going to try to look it up real fast because... There's a weird case with absorption. <clears throat> All right, yeah. So there's a material that someone invented called Vanta Black. And this is a material. 99.99% of all physical objects are going to reflect some amount of light. That's why you're able to see them. But someone invented a paint that absorbs most of the light that strikes it. And the human eye needs reflected light to be able to see things. If no light is coming into your eye, you're just going to detect a flat void, like what you see when your eyes are closed. Someone has invented a material that can be applied as paint that <clears throat> absorbs all light, doesn't reflect any light, and that makes it physically impossible for the human eye to see. So this picture right here that I'm currently circling around, this is two of the same object. This is two of the same face sculpture, but one of them has been covered in Vanta Black, and therefore it no longer reflects any light. So you can't see it. You can't even see its surface details anymore because literally no light is coming off of it. It just looks like a void. It looks like the emptiness of space, honestly. Because that's what the void of space is. It's regions where no light is traveling through. And it kind of looks wrong, honestly. Like, the human eye relies on light bouncing off of things to be able to see it. Even normal black objects reflect some amount of light because you're able to see surface details and, like... Uh, reflections in like a dark colored car but this car is painted in Vanta black so you can't see any surface details on the black parts it's just a void you can tell it's a car because of its shape and because you can still see the tires and the headlights and stuff but if you zoom in on the door far enough you won't be able to see like the details that it's a door you won't be able to see like the curvature or where the handle is uh, so it's a very weird thing that these scientists have invented, and honestly, it's so weird that the government has to regulate who can buy it, because if you painted a car with Vanta Black, you wouldn't be able to be seen at night, and that's illegal for several reasons. If for no other reason, then it would cause a ton of car crashes. So that is all of the light stuff that I wanted to talk about before the semester ended. Uh, and that means that that'll be the end of new material before the exam. Um, so all this light stuff will be on the exam, but won't be on test two. So again, focus on test two, focus on electricity and magnetism. Um, tomorrow we will do, we'll meet for lab, which will be in two electric and magnetism labs. Friday, we'll have an open study day where you can come in and ask questions about the test or the exam. Next week, we'll just be exam prep and then we'll be done with the course. So let me know what you need as you need it. When you take the test, send me questions and send me your answers when you're done. And if I, I'll be in here for the next hour or so answering questions. Uh, if I don't see you today, then I'll see you tomorrow for lab. Welcome.